specific, very different considerations that we get into when we start talking about government. Because governments have to practice PR as well. And also, PR <coughs> practitioners in other sectors need to practice PR to influence government. That's how our system set up. So check it out. Government's everywhere. PR is in it. We've got PR in all government branches. Oh no, I going to do the slow thing. We've got it in all different government agencies. We'll talk more about different agencies as we go through the semester. We've got PR practiced by government on state, local levels, county levels. And we've also got it in the lobbying function. And this is what I just said a second ago, is that companies often hire lobbyists or often practice relation or build relationships with governments to make sure that government is doing things that will favor uh, the different companies. So we got PR all throughout government. So as you can probably predict, a smart politician is going to know, know this. Because practicing good relationships with publics is critical for getting elected. It's critical for getting support for different programs that legislators will, will be working on. And it's also critical for getting their policies adopted. I mean, if, if government is not practicing good relations with its publics, then it becomes ineffective. It can't get anything done. And if the government can't get anything done, what happens? What happens? Take, take a while, guys. It's defective. What else? What happens? The country fails. What else? No one likes them. No one likes them. Yeah, what happens? When nobody likes a politician, what happens to that politician? They don't get reelected. Exactly. So, let's take a look at this. In recent years, we've had, uh, well, probably since the Bush administration, government. Well, government's been on a steadily increasing track regarding size. It's been steadily increasing probably since the uh, FDR administration, when government had to step in and pretty much save us from a crippling depression. And it's been on a trajectory for growth ever since. It exploded during the Bush administration. Uh, it got really, really big. And see, I didn't understand that. I mean, politicians kept running on tickets saying, Oh, we're on platform saying, oh, we've got to reduce the government, the size of the government. But I mean, that's when it exploded was during the Bush years. But this is oh, this is not all bad because governments are the largest employers of PR people. That's good news for us, right? For job wise. Job wise, exactly. There are tons of jobs out there in PR. You can go out and like trip on a rake and hit your head and land in a PR job. Lots of jobs out there. So, as you can probably guess, a lot of you may end up practicing PR for some kind of government. Um, who is our, oh, she's not in here. Um, this very program sends a lot of people into internships in government, especially local government. Uh, I have a student who is currently working for the city right now, and uh, the PR position for them Chamber of Commerce hires a lot of people. That's not really government. That's, that's something different. All right, so what's going on? How is this government increasing? Well, since the 70s, this is my heyday as a young type. I was born in the 70s. Anybody else born? I don't know what I born in the 70s. You guys were born like, what, the 90s or something, right? Anybody born in the 80s? Nobody. This is why none of my jokes, you guys don't laugh and you can't say. <laughs> so there's like no, <laughs> we just don't have the connection. I mean, <laughs> all right, maybe Netflix will start showing more 80s shows. All right, so since the 70s, we've had more than 20 regulatory agencies pop up. Lots of them. We've got more than 120 new agencies and programs that are now regulating business. This may be a good thing. I mean, we've got to make sure that that radio. Those nuclear warheads that they're shipping out to the Panhandle of West Texas are, you know, shipped safely. Nuclear waste being shipped out to Nevada, we need to make sure that that's regulated and shipped safely. New pharmaceuticals and drugs, we need to make sure that those are, are safe for people to use. 
The Department of Defense, has anybody been in the military considering military service? Nobody. That's why you're in college. You don't want to go to Afghanistan. Well, the Department of Defense employs over 7,000 PR specialists. 7,000. We'll get into uh, some of their titles here in a minute, but let's take a look at the history real quick. 1913, this is significant right here. The Gillette Amendment stated that appropriated funds may not be used to pay a publicity expert a public relations person unless specifically appropriate for that purpose. So what does that mean? It means we can't use tax dollars to pay publicity experts or PR people. How do we get around that? This is the huge question of the semester. How do we get around not being able to pay for publicity experts with government money? Any ideas? Wait, hold on a second. No ideas. How do we get around that? Last call is very simple, surprisingly simple. What's that? How do we get around it? If we can't employ public relations people in government, but obviously we do, you name them differently. Exactly. We call them, we call them public affairs officers, we call them information officers, press secretaries, communication specialists. Because the Gillette Amendment specifically prohibits hiring public relations people and publicity experts. So we just have to change the name. We, so we use things like information officer and stuff like that. Um, all right, let's move on. All right, so let's, let's, let's take a brief. Who else had political science? Everybody, all right, let's take a brief crash course on this. We know that there's a different hierarchy of the U.S. government. On top, a lot of the land is federal, run by the Constitution, supposedly. Um, this includes the legislative branch, which are representatives and senators, people that sit around cook enough ways to make bills and justify their existence. We've got the executive branch, which includes the president, his staff, cabinet, departments, commissions, agencies, things like that. And then we've got the judicial branch. That didn't make it in my PowerPoint for some reason. So let's take a look at the state. We've got legislators, we've got representatives and senators, just as we do at the federal level. And then we've also got an executive branch at the state level, which is governor, staff, Rick Perry, all these types of things. Rick Perry is still governor. Did I miss an election? No. He's just no. he's a felon, no. right? Yep. He's a felonious governor. Or he's been charged with a felony. Yeah. He hasn't been convicted yet. No. You think he'll do any time? No. Neither do I. Below the state, of course, we have the county. We've got different county executive type positions. Um, county officials, commissioners, departments, etc. Somebody name a county office. Executive County Office. Wait, I'm, I'm hearing something, but I'm not hearing it loud enough to. She said DMV. DMV. Is that is that the county or is that yeah? I don't that's know. That's that. state. I don't think so. I don't know. Well, you're close. You're close because when you go to DMV, eventually you've got to get your you got to pay your car registration, which is handled by the county tax assessor. And those people they have no sense of humor, and the police that pull you over for an expired registration sticker. No sense of humor. So let that be a lesson. Keep your registration stickers up to date. I think you get a month's grace when they expire. All right, then we get to city level. We got mayors and city councils, city officials. 
things like that. There is one other government. Can anybody tell me what it is? What other level of government? And they hire PR people too. And they have elected officials. It may be subordinate or possibly equal to the city, but it's also tied in with the state. What? Yeah. It starts with the, uh, depends on the area. Well, it's, it's where your property, you guys don't pay property taxes yet, but it's where property taxes go to. Property taxes go to support the local. No, local school district. There we go, school district. Um, you guys are going to find out that I have a man crush on Ralph Nader. You guys know who Ralph Nader is? He's a seatbelt guy, yeah, he was, he, he was hated. Ralph Nader has an interesting, interesting story. I mean, he took on GM. And because GM was making manufacturing dangerous products, what they were doing, I mean, it was just all kinds of, who always slammed their hand in the car door? Everybody, who always slammed their hand in the 1969 Impala door? I mean, this is a total different universe of pain. I mean, this is like shattered fingers and bones going to the hospital. These cars were dangerous. Or they, well, I mean, they were dangerous for little kids getting in and out of um, they also had uh, steering columns. People would get in a head-on collision, and the steering wheel would break off the steering column, and the, the steering column would impale them. So they used to show these movies in driver's ed classes. I don't know if they still do or not. But people would get impaled because they had a head-on collision. No such thing as airbags or seat belts, nothing like that. Um, so and uh, so Ralph Nader was instrumental in that. Well, GM hated that. G General Motors did not like Ralph Nader one bit. So they sent prostitutes to try to seduce him to get it on tape. It was the 60s. No, uh, Ralph Nader is incorruptible. Um, here's what Ralph Nader has to say about government, though. I mean, he's, he's he had his, 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 uh, his opinion. He's, he's run for president a couple of times. I'll tell you about the time I saw him run for president. Here's what he says. In this nation, where the ultimate power is said to rest with the people, it is clear that the free and prompt flow of information from government to the people is essential. This is a principle of democracy. This is not necessarily a principle of PR. Well, it is a principle of PR. Eh. Take that as a principle of PR. I'm going to add that to my list. This will probably be on the final. <laughs> huh? It might be. Because um, I, I, ideally, I mean, uh, to, to vote effectively, to be informed voters, we've got to have information. And if we've just got just a bunch of like lies and Obama's uh, from Kenya or Mars or whatever. You guys heard the, the Obama Mars theory, right? <laughs> They went to Mars. Michelle Obama's a man. Theory. What? Michelle Obama's a man. Yeah. Michelle Obama's a man. I haven't heard this one. Yeah, and they're like, her kids are not hers. She adopted them. No, so they're adopted kids. She's a man can't have kids. Like, it's just a lot. That's a new one for me. All right. So there's a lot of a lot of BS out there. But this is for our democracy to function well. We need to have access to good information and be able to make rational decisions based on that good information. All right, so let's take a look at some different branches of government. What is, you guys know what the State Department does? What does the State Department do? They may do some of that. The State Department, the government, Donald Rumsfeld, was it Donald Rumsfeld? Oh, I can't remember now. This is going back to time. State Department, anybody, got a, anybody traveling internationally anytime soon? Yes. All right. You got a passport? 
All right. So you went to get the State Department has yeah. passports. Most they do. They're responsible for, they have press briefings. They, what else do they do? They, of course, maintain their web page. Everybody maintains their web page. Um, they operate foreign access centers. I don't know if they operate consulates or not. I think they, they do operate consulates. So if you get arrested in, I don't know, Guatemala City, you want to contact the State Department to uh, see what you got to do to get out. So they provide all kinds of services abroad for Americans. You lose your passport abroad, you go to the State Department, and they uh, theoretically they issue you a new one. They also do a lot of public uh, diplomacy operations abroad. We'll get into more detail about some of those here in a second. Um, yes, the, oh, this is the propaganda agency. The United States Information Agency. What does that sound like? Um, I'm sure they work together on things. Um, they probably do, I don't know, but more importantly what they do, these people support the national interest by basically creating propaganda, by convey, they, by, they protect and project an American image abroad. They convey an understanding to other countries about what the U.S. is, what it stands for, ideals, values, things like that. And I love this one. It works to build the intellectual and institutional foundations of democracy in societies around the globe. What does that sound like to you guys? <laughs> You're talking about assimilation? Yeah, that. Assimilation of Native Americans? Oh. That's what that sounds like. Oh, the U.S. would never do something like that. Um, this is what's going on in the Middle East. There are a lot of uh, academics in the Middle East. We talked a little bit about Edward S. Said a couple of days ago. Um, I think we probably boil this down to assimilation. The more people different from us are like us, the less likely they are to slit our throats. That's kind of a graphic way to put it, but does that make sense? People more like us, there's less danger, more pathways to friendship. So this may be in our best interest. I mean, I, I, I sound very critical of it, but I don't know. Maybe I'm alive because of it. I don't know. All right, what else do they do? They support the war on drugs in producer and consumer countries. Colombia, Mexico. Anybody watch... Was it Sons of Anarchy? They have a new season out, don't they? Nobody watches Sons of Anarchy? You know what I'm talking about? All right, all right, let's start. All right, all right, awesome. Okay. Um, yes, they support the war on drugs. What else do they do? They develop a lot of informational programs. <laughs> Tell these to address environmental challenges. I'm not sure of the details on this one. But environmental issues <coughs> is one of the things that they participate in. But I love this one. So this is out straight out of your textbook right here. Bring truth to any society that fails to exercise free and open communication. What's the problem with that? What, what problem do you guys see with that? They don't let us exercise free communication. That is another aspect. I, that wasn't what I was looking for, but. Uh, yeah. Bring truth to any society that fails to exercise open communication. Nobody sees any problem with that? I mean, I do. Does that truth to the perspective of the African American community in the United States? Is that truth from people who've immigrated here illegally to escape, escape harsh conditions? Like, whose truth is that? That is the big question right there. Is whose truth is that? But 
This is not a critical, well, this is a critical thinking class, but we're not going to take this with you and think critically about it in the shower later on. All right, uh, here's how the USIA does this. Check this out. Here's how we spread the gospel of America. We've got lots of different tactics. Radio, TV, this is my favorite one, film and television. Uh, specifically, my favorite is um, Stargate SG-1. All the armed services have a uh, DVD sales and bootlegs are a hot thing abroad. Has anybody been to a foreign country where they've got you know, bootleg DVDs for sale on the street for like a buck a piece? You been there? We do that back home. Wait, where's back home again? In uh, England. In England. Oh, they do it in England too? Yeah. Okay. But you like, they're not supposed to let anybody know who the person is, but they just randomly pop up. It's kind of sketchy. Oh, okay. They just kind of set up shop, sell DVDs, and get out. I think they do that a lot at the flea markets. Anybody been to the international flea market or the Guns Point? Well, we already talked about that. Nobody knows where it is. Green's Point. Um, all the armed services and uh, probably other government agencies have uh, offices in Hollywood where they will exchange things like shooting locations, equipment, airplanes, boats, and signing things. The Coast Guard trades off like boats and extras and stuff like that in exchange for a crack at the script. So, in essence, a lot of Hollywood productions are made financially viable by being able to borrow these different things from government agencies, but uh, the script needs to reflect the agency in a good light. We talked about that with Stargate the other day, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody go watch Stargate SG-1 after I talked about it? No? Oh. <laughs> My feelings are hurt. What else do we do? The Gospel of America, we preach it through internet, other media, publications, exhibitions, libraries and books, education. All right, so let's look at the Department of Defense. Now, the Department of Defense is huge. They have, I think it was 7,000 people working as PR people, the public affairs, public information officers in the Department of Defense. Um, they have three, over, over three million active duty forces, reserves, civilian employees, over three million people involved, involved with uh, the United States uh, defense or war machine, whatever you want to call it. The Secretary of Defense is the head of their public affairs. A lot of stuff comes out of the Pentagon, trickles on down to public affairs people at lower levels. It's a very hierarchical setup. Uh, we haven't had time to talk about hierarchical versus network. See, this is why our, the Coast Guard is so fascinating. The Coast Guard provides a, just a, a phenomenal um, example of a difference and how public affairs can be practiced. Like, for example, the different most military branches, uh, the public affairs are handled by people in charge at the Pentagon, and then we've got people at lower levels, like at the base level, that handle like the local uh, public affairs. The Coast Guard is different. The Coast Guard is networked and autonomous. These people don't necessarily have to answer to Pentagon people to the extent that other armed forces do and other people in the Department of Defense. Um, most Coast Guard public affairs is handled like a support level. And I think I posted, have I posted that on D2L, a paper on the Coast Guard? No? All right, it's going up in a little while. All right, the um, Department of Defense maintains the Armed Forces Radio, TV. They have a newspaper called Stars and Stripes. There's just, there's tons of media. There's probably a lot of, there's a lot of base level media too as well. So I think the point I'm trying to drive home here is that this is a huge operation. Three million people with 7,000 just people in PR or public affairs alone uh, managing this huge, the, the public affairs for a huge, giant machine. This is a significant, uh, significant employer. What else we got here? We got regulatory agencies. Anybody think of any regula regulatory agencies? 
Very good. Very good. What else? Uh, almost. FDA. 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 Yeah, yeah. CDC. CDC. Yeah, we can go with that. Then there are just tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of government agencies out there. And all these government agencies out there are going to have publics, and they're you can't be friends with everybody all the time, so they're going to have people with whom they've got to try to build relationships and inroads with to be able to operate to the best of their ability. And PR plays a huge role in that. What else we got? Department of Health and Human Services. Department of Agriculture. The Treasury. CIA. Has anybody thought about going to work for the CIA? Seriously? Yeah. Have you applied or? You? No, I just, you just thought about it. Yeah, I just did that. Okay, they were hiring a bunch of people here a few years ago. Might be an option. All right, so let's talk about the president. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. This is kind of random, I'm sorry, but you said CIA. Taken three is coming out. I just saw the trailer yesterday, and no, this is PR related, kind of. Yes, um, I like where you're going with it. Keep talking. Taken three is coming out. Well, was Taken is a video game. Taken, no, Taken, 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 Taken. 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 Okay. Wrong taken. I'm thinking taken 1994. It's about PR. Okay. I just seen the guy. Right. Okay. Anyway, so taken three is coming out. He used to what, be special forces retired. One and two, his child got kidnapped. Then they got kidnapped. There's a whole bunch of extra. Anyway, as far as like PR relations is concerned, as far as um like trying to catch somebody on the run and like informing the public. Like, how, how much involved is PR? Do you get what I'm trying to say? Are you asking like, about how much PR goes on whenever there's a, you're talking about crisis like communication. Like a huge, yeah, thing like that. You're talking like, about crisis communication. Like, we have a shooter in Washington, D.C. You guys remember the guy that, they got in the trunk of the car and were sniping people? I mean, it was a few years ago. Well, I mean, occasionally we have these type of things. You're talking about crisis communication, we'll get into that later, deeper, or deeper later in the semester. How much PR goes on? These things are planned for. Right now, SFA has a crisis plan for anything you can imagine, or probably anything you can imagine. So especially things like school shooters and uh, fires, explosions, and stuff like that. So what happens is, in these types of situations, it's going to break on social media first. Somebody's going to say, oh, there's a sniper out in front of the dining hall, or in front of the, I don't know, where would a sniper go on an SFA campus? I don't know. In front of the library. Library. Okay, there's a sniper on top of the library. And so shots ring out. All of a sudden, we're like University of Texas, Austin, 1968 or 67, whatever it was. And it's going to break on social media. And then what's going to happen is, I don't know if it's going to be social media. I don't know how it's going to be informed. But once the police get a hold of it, a big machine is going to go into operation, a big plan that they have for these types of things. And so. I mean, there's no telling how the crisis will go, but there are plans in place for dealing with that. The police will probably be trying to apprehend the shooter or, or something like that, but the communication people will be trying to stab, the, keep the media away from the, the danger zone and report to them like every 15 minutes. And the media in turn will report to uh, uh, newspaper, radio, et cetera. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, they did that at my college I went to. It was one star, and there was a stabbing. Um, stabbing. At the campus, and um, we were on some like I think it's that eight people total, <coughs> and they were the, they had PR already ready for them. They were new though, because long time they've been there for like four or five years now, but okay. they were getting some new ones so after we were on. Okay, so but they have a plan in place for these mm -hmm. types of things. Mm -hmm. So that's you, generally these types of crises. I mean, and and the PR people don't sleep until it's done. Um, our uh, better fact, who, has anybody met Sally Mathis Ramsey? She's our uh, professional advisor for PRSSA. Mm -hmm. She deals in crisis all the time. She has clients going in crisis all the time. Now, it's not crises like a school shooter or anything like that. It's probably more crises like, I don't know, somebody got poisoned by some food at Walmart or you know, th stuff like that. Um, now, 
in terms of like larger scale crises, like a terrorist attack, or a nuclear weapon goes off in New Orleans, or something like that happens, um, all branches of the United States, all, all agencies of the United States, there is like a large master plan for dealing with these large scale types of types of things. So, and PR is a huge part of it, keeping the public informed, keeping telling them where to stay out of. Um, especially like after a hurricane. Anybody been in a hurricane? What happened? Well, there's a hurricane that came through. What happened? Oh, I stayed in the house. You stayed in the house. What did you do in the house? Didn't really do much with the lights being on. Can't do anything with the lights off. So what do you do? Sit. You sit. And listen to the old radio. And listen to the radio. And what goes on on the radio during the hurricane? News. They say stay. Yeah, they say stay off the roads. There's power lines down. Things like that. So radio becomes like a critical medium uh, during these times. And this is kind of a tangent, but I hope that kind of gets at your question. We'll get more into crisis communication later in the semester, but that's a very good question. All right, so let's talk about the, the present for a second. This person probably wields more clout than anybody else in the universe, or at least in the world. Um, he controls the bully pulpit. In the word, this used to mean the superb pulpit, or like the, the, the superb position. But now it's kind of, people have become kind of disgruntled with politics, so it's uh, not, it doesn't have the same meaning that it used to have. But he controls much of the nation's agenda. I mean, presidential speeches, that is what often sets the media agenda right there. If we're dealing with, uh, I don't know, bombings in Syria or something like that. The president brings it up, we can guarantee the news media is going to follow that. Or if we're dealing with economic crisis, unemployment, layoffs, and outsourcing here at home in the United States, you can guarantee the media is going to follow that. Remember agenda setting, the theory of agenda setting? Oftentimes it's not the media that sets agendas, it's, it's the figures of such cloud as the president. The press secretary, we'll talk about the press secretary in a second, provides the White House press corps with announcements and daily press <coughs> briefings. You gotta keep the press fed and they get hungry and go elsewhere for food. And if they go elsewhere for food, then you don't control what they eat. So ideally, it's best to be proactive and feed the press the things that you want to feed them. Does that make sense? <coughs> You want to control their diet so they don't get unhealthy attitudes for you. President's press secretary has been called the second most difficult job in the administration. I don't know. I think I'd rather have that job than the president's job, to be honest. But it's probably a matter of opinion. Uh, the chief public PR spokesperson for the administration. Uh, what was that guy's name? He just left. He has like a, a funny name. The guy with glasses. Who's the president's press secretary? Oh, God. Oh, it's going to drive me crazy. Oh, well, we're not going to worry about it right now. Look him up. It was Jay. I think he's on the test. So, you guys need to know his name for the test. What is it? It's a Jay, and it's no longer this guy. Yes, Jay Carney, thank you. Yeah, I should have got you guys to look it up. All right. Um, a lot of these people come from PR careers rather than journalism careers. That's something to keep in mind. They know how to smooth talk. You know, William Sapper, Nixon's speechwriter, has to say about the press secretary's role. A good press secretary speaks up to the press to the president and speaks out for the president to the press. He makes his home in the pit of no man's land of an adversary relationship and is primarily an advocate, interpreter, and amplifier. He must be more of the president's man than the press's, but he can be his own man as well. So imagine that you're living in borderlands in between different ideologies, partisanship, <coughs> functions. I mean, that's, that's kind of a really, I would imagine that would be a very, very challenging place to exist in between everybody. 
that make sense? Or am I just kind of waxing poetic here? Can somebody tell me who replaced Jay Carney? I'll go to the next slide. And that was relatively recently, too. Josh Ernest, oh yeah, that was what was so funny. It's like Josh Ernest, yeah. it's like joking but serious. <laughs> Beautiful name. Let's talk about lobbying. Is anybody related to a lobbyist? Anybody know any lobbyists? Oh, this is huge. It's a huge field right now. Our nation is corrupt to the core due to lobbying. All right. It's in a business's best interest to work hard to influence the government so it doesn't do anything, or that, so that it does do something, it doesn't do anything that hurts the business, or that it can, does something that helps the business. Does that make sense? What are some of the big lobbyists these days, lobbying firms? Or, any lobbying going on, so what are some of the big ones? You guys are young. You can appreciate this. We've got like, yeah. Who, and who's lobbying for it, or who's lobbying against it? The police officers. The police officers are against the legalization of marijuana, or they're lobbyists or advocating that position. Um, what would happen if people stopped getting arrested for marijuana? Jails, well, they might not be well, empty, but there would be fewer criminals. The government I mean, loses if it weren't, the, the possession of marijuana was not a crime. Or if it, well, because it's a crime, it creates criminals. Does that make sense? So police officers, organizations are against it. This also, and, and prisons as well. Prisons are also against legalization of marijuana. Prison, what, what the hell, what is the connection there? A prison, why would a prison system be against Exactly, especially with the push towards privatizing prisons. So this is how we get this stuff done in our world, is we hire lobbyists to get it done for us. Um, lobbying is one of the nation's great growth industries. Something like 35,000 now registered in Washington. I mean, that's like the size of how big is Temple, Texas? This one? This one. How big is Temple? It's like 32,000. All right, so the population of Temple, if everybody like went to Washington to become a lawyer, it would like double or something like that. Temple, Texas. It's small. All right. So, I mean, that's, that's, <coughs> still, that's still a huge number of people in one town uh, trying to like push people to do stuff. And that's double what it was 10, 15 years ago. Double. It's big business. Imagine that six million dollars per day. What's that? It's getting into like the 1.9102 billion a year or something like that. Just not lobbying. They get paid very well. This may be an option if you guys want to take your PR degree and turn it into a money-making cash cow. Lobbying may be, if you're good at it, persuasive. Then uh, you can make some money. All right, so <coughs> here's a question. Let's go back to our history class. It might be political science. Which constitutional amendment protects lobbying? Um, yeah, which amendment? What's it called? First. The First Amendment. That's right. <coughs> Come on, work my things. Mm -hmm. All right. So what do lobbyists do? Um, I've already said this. They work to influence legislation. They might speed up legislation. They might slow it down. Or they might try to change the opinions of people who are voting on legislation. 
in different ways. They inform, persuade, make contacts, constantly networking. They always have the right information. So I imagine this would be a very challenging job, but they, again, they are well reimbursed uh, for what they do. Some of their specific activities include fact-finding. You gotta find out what a company's up to, what government is up to, what's going on. You gotta be able to have a good, broad view of different scenarios. You gotta be able to interpret government and company actions. So you gotta be able to speak government ease and marketing ease, or something like that. Um, you gotta be able to advocate for positions. Lobbying is also called a publicity springboard. What do I mean by that? A publicity springboard. Any ideas? Let's think about that. Publicity springboard. I think of a diving board. You know, kind of a bouncy kind of thing. You can use this to launch publicity. Um, also, support of sales is one of these things the lobbyists may do. Uh, let's see what we get lobbying. Now we get to the slide, the, the obligatory slide in any profession. Internet's changed the world. Let's see, here's what happened. Bush Gore, presidential election 2000. This is where we really started seeing the web and political campaigns, especially, or it was in 2004, we especially started seeing blogs. Was anybody blogging back then? I was blogging back then. It was a thing to do. Does anybody blog at all still? A few people? No, I keep blogging. It's good. It's good for you. Um, Later on, it's a, you know, it's in the Obama campaign in 2008 that we really saw social media take off, um, particularly Facebook, particularly uh, uh, Twitter as well. I don't remember Obama being on MySpace, but it may have happened. I don't know. If, can somebody look at that up to see if Obama has a MySpace account? You don't have to, but all right. So by now, as you probably guess, political movements all levels of society uh, use the internet to inform voters, influence legislators, and use it to basically further agendas. I mean, that was part of the research background I have. I was studying anti-illegal immigration movements, and I was uh, studying them through their websites. They were using their websites to disseminate propaganda. The, some of them had some kind of rudimentary uh, like message boards and forums and things like that for different members to communicate with each other, but they weren't terribly advanced. Um, later on, they started, just as social media was kind of taken off about 2008, a lot of these groups were uh, starting to use Facebook, but a lot of them kind of shifted from, well, we're tired of doing immigration, we're going to go join the Tea Party now. So a lot of people switched over to doing Tea Party kind of things from immigration. And then people kind of come and go back and forth between, you know, these types of organizations. Let's talk about political action committees. You guys know what, what's a political action committee? Any idea? Political action committees. Uh, they, give money. they give money, or they raise money. They do things like that. Some are, well, some people want to get these out of politics, actually. All right, they generally revolve around interests, whether it's guns or teachers, medicine, labor unions. Um, just around the 70s, back in my heyday, I say my heyday, I was like in diapers. There were only around 600 packs. But now by 2009, this has changed, and we're looking at 4,600. These things now hold huge sways in the election. 
You guys remember John Kerry? You do remember John Kerry. Okay, so he got kind of swift footed. That pack. Um, PACs will work with and around laws to promote campaigns, candidates, and things like that. <coughs> They'll do like a kind of third party advertising. You guys see a lot of third party advertising. Did you have a question? Or just scratch it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, in a second, I'm going to put a PAC ad. A good one. Yeah, okay, well, let's go. With, let's deal with local government first. We'll see if we can find a good PAC ad. All right, so dealing with local government. Local government's a lot different. As you can probably expect, local government is a lot different from dealing with the federal government. Um, when you're dealing with local governments, the opinion leaders are key. I mean, people like the, our mayor, the tennis mayor, city council, I guess I, you guys think of me as an opinion leader? I guess I am an opinion leader. I'm an opinion leader? Yeah. Union leaders, teachers, civil service workers, um, pillars in the community. Opinion leaders are key. And why do you guys think that is? They've got influence. What do we call that theory? Two-step flow. That's right. We think in terms of uh, media, or information goes to opinion leaders who then share it with people around them. As opinion leaders, they have more influence. And we know that people around us have more influence on us based on the limited effects paradigm. I'm going back pretty far here, a couple of weeks anyway. Based on the limited effects paradigm, or they have much more effect on us than like TV or mediated messages, things we hear on the radio or reading the paper. Um, some of the best ways to work with the public in terms of information involve forums, debates, sometimes media interviews, especially like on the news and stuff like that. Anybody listen to the rock band ministry? Okay, I'm going back too far again. I'm just getting more and more disconnected from you guys. I'm going to have to like start, I don't know, like watching newer stuff or something. But direct contact, handshakes, things like that, I mean, these things are necessary to help keep people informed and keep lines of communication between organizations and local leaders or local opinions, uh, opinion leaders open. There's some good news on this. Check it out. Local and state government, tons of PR jobs. I'm not kidding. I mean, you guys could like trip and fall down the stairs out here and land a PR job or an internship. I mean, there are just tons and tons and tons and tons out there. I'm going to try to get Sarah O'Brien. Sarah O'Brien practices PR for the uh, uh, for the city of Nacogdoches. So I'm going to try to get her in here at some point um, if we've got some time to do that. What else we got? All right, let's sum it up and look for some political, some pack ads. A lot of people, I mean, you've heard this story. I mean, government's growing and crushing us and, and, and smushing us and taxes and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, did you guys, did you guys feel the crippling blow of taxes? Has anybody ever made enough money to pay taxes? Well, they take it out of your check. They take it out of your check and they get it back at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's why I mean, having kids actually gets you a lot of money back too as well. So. Um, all right, but <laughs> although you hear all the complaints about government getting big and huge and, and, and crippling our lives and crushing us, I mean that's just that is good news for you guys because that means there is a lot of PR. That means first off, people are not happy, and when people aren't happy, what's the solution? Make them happy. Public relations. Build relationships with them. Make them happy somehow. What else we got? We want a state. <laughs> so expertise is necessary at all levels, but I mean, state and local, I mean, if they can get good PR people, then 
What's uh? I'm gonna add another area to this actually. Who, who, who probably has the worst PR as a as a group as a general institution has the worst PR ever? The police, right? What I can't understand is why we have so many Ferguson type incidents, or so many kids getting a bomb dropped in their crib by a SWAT team looking for pot, or why we have so many of these horrible, terrible interactions with police, and there's just no PR people. It, it seems like we're just not hearing from the public affairs people. I mean, do you guys get that same sense? The public affairs people? I mean, it's messed up. They say that well, then they should be getting paid. They don't want to do it. I mean, it's like, it, it seems like a lot of police people are falling down the job. I mean, it sounds like there are management issues as well, but I mean, it sounds like a lot of PR people are falling down on the job because you never hear, yes, our team made a mistake, we're sorry, we're working to correct it, and we're going to make sure it never happens again. You never hear that from anything. You just skip the meme with the guy cracking the guy's skull open with a... With a Call it a, a, a person being, huh? A baton? A baton or a nightstick. Nightstick. Night All right. So here's a good projection for you guys. The need for PR is going to grow as we become a more diverse society, as we have uh, our communities change, as we have just change in general going on. PR is going to be growing. You guys are in luck. So let's take a look. I want to go back to I want to find a good political action committee ad. So I want to make it clear what PACs do. For anybody that's not clear on it yet. Texas governor over what to do to secure the U.S.-Mexico border. 
Perry has been one of the fiercest critics of the White House for its handling of the border situation so far, and he made headlines last month when he called for 1,000 National Guard troops to be deployed to combat the surge in unaccompanied minors crossing into the country illegally. Perry has been in the key battleground state of Iowa over the past few days where he's spoken out on the need to combat the rise in illegal immigrants crossing into the country. Immigration could very well become one of the central issues in the 2016 presidential election, and Perry is sure to appeal to some Republicans for his hard stance on securing the southwest border. For WashingtonExaminer.com, I'm Steve Doty. All right, so what's, what's the message right there? What's the message? I know it's a news article about a PAC ad, but... That's very true. Sorry, I'm not going to Vote for Rick Perry. That's the message.